D neither. It's my. <laughs> Hey guys, we're live. Um, we've been chatting away so much we forgot to go live. So anyway, I'd really like you guys to meet Mike Farrell. We've been having such a laugh getting ready for this live. Um, I'm hoping that you will all really get something out of tonight. We're going to be quite blunt, really, aren't we? We're going to try and really stick to the facts and try and get some truth out there because I think this condition needs us to spend a little bit of time really opening people's minds to hip dysplasia because there's a lot of people out there that have this it with their dog might have it in their own dog a friend's dog they might be a breeder and they're really worried about you know the whole hip dysplasia in the breed there's going to be a lot of people listening so shut up hannah let's get to the point please tell them a little bit about yourself mike Oh, my profile. Uh, so <clears throat> I qualified from the RVC in 1997. Uh, I have worked initially in an anesthesia and critical care. Um, I've worked in general practice, uh, various university and um, private referral practices. And um, yeah, tomorrow I'm moving to New Zealand um, to work in a specialist practice in Auckland. Oh, my God. So his basic words to me were, yeah, let's really get the truth out there and then I'm going to run away. <laughs> it's like, brilliant, thanks. <laughs> so, okay, let's, let's get straight into there. Let's talk about something that I think is really, really important to clear up immediately is that there is a broad range of hip dysplasia, isn't there? I think that's a very key point that we need to make at the moment because I know that I have owners come onto Holly's arm and they go, my dog's got hip dysplasia. And it's almost like you've got it or you haven't. So it's binary, yes or no. What's your thoughts on that? It's the most important starting point. I see the same thing. Um, people will, they'll get this diagnosis of hip dysplasia and it's kind of treated like a life sentence. Um, but you're right. The, the majority of cases of hip dysplasia are hidden and don't have a clinical consequence. <laughs> so I think when you're classifying hip dysplasia, you can do it in all sorts of different ways. But the easiest starting point is to classify it as a dog that has genes that code for hip dysplasia, but they don't actually have hip dysplasia. Dogs that have genes that code for hip dysplasia and an abnormal radiograph, but no clinical sign. That's the biggest group by a mile. And then dogs that have clinical hip dysplasia. <coughs> So when you're talking about how to manage dogs, you're talking about basically two different populations. One that have an abnormal X-ray with no clinical signs, and one that have an abnormal X-ray with clinical signs. Yeah, okay. So that's a really key point, guys, that it isn't a black and white condition. And we see this all the time. Something that I want to kind of clear up is that people come onto Holly's arm and they say, my dog's got hip dysplasia, but generally the dogs that they're talking about are in their latter years. So at that point, they've actually got hip osteoarthritis secondary to hip dysplasia. Can you just clarify so that people understand what the difference is, but how they're associated? Yes. I think probably uh, go right to the big it, beginning, okay, of what really is it? What What is hip dysplasia? So um, the, the first thing, that, Many people don't know it's treated like a congenital disease, right? So that means that a puppy is born with abnormal hips, but that, that's not true. Puppies born with morphologically normal hips, they have a series of genes that code for hip dysplasia. <clears throat> Whether or not those genes are expressed, we'll talk about in a minute. They have then a problem of laxity of the hip, and that laxity then causes remodeling of the hip. The remodeling of the hip is the body's attempt to make things better. It's got a loose hip and the body tries to fix the problem. And then subsequently, you have a dog with an arthritic hip, which is caused by this problem of laxity, followed by abnormal shape of the hip. So you've got dysplasia and you've got secondary osteoarthritis. The secondary osteoarthritis is in part the body trying to fix the problem. So when you take an x-ray, you'll feel this new bone around about the hip. And that scares people, they think, ah, you know, I've got this horrible looking hip. But in many cases, that's actually something which is the body trying to help the issue. Mm. And inside the joint, you've got cartilage disease, which is osteoarthritis. 
Right, cool. So just so you know, guys, because a lot of people come into um, Holly's Arm and I feel like correcting them and I really don't want to because it's not really a cool thing to do. But they come in and their dog's like a 10 year old Labrador. They go, my dog's got hip dysplasia. You're like, no, at this point, your dog's got osteoarthritis. So, right, let's, shall we start with a case and follow it through? So from a young puppy and go through, because that's kind of what we were trying to do, wasn't it? So we'll start really young. Um, right in around about six to eight weeks and then go through. You've stalled. Come back. You're back. Cool. <laughs> Maybe you leave. Leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to let you leave because I know that you have what you need to say in your head and then I'll keep interjecting. So let's start as a puppy and move, move on. Yeah. So I think you approach it from an owner perspective. So the first thing an owner will ask, well, if I'm if I'm going to buy a puppy, you know, how do I give myself the best chance of that puppy not having hip dysplasia, right? Um, and then that's a matter of trying to select a dog with a good family history. That part of it, most people know, right? You, you need to look for uh, a family lines of a dog where they have a, a, a low history of hip dysplasia, and that basically means radiographic scoring in the UK, right? So then you've got your young puppy. For most people, you're getting your puppy at, what, eight, ten weeks? Mm -hmm. And at that point, you maybe have a puppy that's an at-risk puppy, and you're trying to work out what are the factors which can affect whether that puppy expresses genes to code for hip dysplasia. Okay. So let's just pause there. So a little people, I think people are going to go, whoa, what's going on? Partly because your sound is a little bit echoey, people are saying. So we're just going to take really slow tonight, guys. So a lot of people believe that a dog is born with hip dysplasia and that's their journey made from the bed's laid, bed's made, and they've got to lay in it. And it's not actually that's the case. All puppies are actually born with the, the, the ability that at that point they have potentially good hips but their genetic code makes them vulnerable, plus there's other variables that affect. Is that fair to say? So they've got a genetic code that's gonna make them vulnerable to developing worsening hip dysplasia, i.e. that means that they're not gonna have a good ball and socket, but there are other variables that influence as well. Is that fair to say? Yeah, here's a, a good illustration. So <clears throat> a study was done where they took uh, a group of dogs that had family lines that gave them a very high chance of developing hip dysplasia. <clears throat> Most of the dogs in those family lines had hip dysplasia and they were Labradors. They took that group of Labradors with hip dysplasia and they crossed those Labradors with greyhounds that had an incidence of hip dysplasia of nearly nothing. So there are some breeds that are genetically privileged. They just don't get hip dysplasia and greyhounds are one of them. So what happens when you take a group of dogs with hip dysplasia and you cross them with a group of dogs without hip dysplasia is simple in the first instance. You have a dog that looks halfway in between a Labrador and a Greyhound, a half and half kind of looking dog, and they have about a 50% chance of developing hip dysplasia, okay? Right, yeah. So your first thought is, well, that's good. We can dilute the genes uh, of hip dysplasia. But I think people misinterpret it if there's some kind of magic involved with crossing two different breeds, which is called hybrid vigor. That is, if I've got a mixed breed dog, just the fact that it's a mixed breed means they have got a low chance of developing hip dysplasia. That's not the case. But what they did next in this experiment was they took these puppies, 50% Labrador, 50% Greyhound, and they crossed them with 100% Greyhound. So the next litter of puppies, they're called the F2 generation. That litter of puppies looked quite like a greyhound because they were three yeah. greyhounds. The incidence of hip dysplasia in that group was one in 34. Oh. So the moral of this story is that if you take the genes that code for hip dysplasia and you put them in a certain type of dog, in this case, a greyhound, and they look like a greyhound, those genes won't express. Mm. Take the same group of genes and you put them in a dog that looks like a dog with a high incidence of hip dysplasia, 
like a bulldog or a pug, those genes will express. So the number one most influential factor in whether the genes express is the breed that those genes are contained in. Right. Why a greyhound is probably not going to get hip dysplasia. If you buy a bulldog, almost certainly it's going to get hip dysplasia. Okay. So yes. For the show notes, you know, we, we can include links of looking up your dog breed and see how likely is your dog breed to get hip dysplasia, right? That's a starting yeah. point. <clears throat> if you want to reduce the incidence, you don't say, well, I'm going to take my Labrador, which has got a moderate risk, and I'm going to cross my Labrador with a Poodle, one of the most popular breeds at the moment, because those dogs have both got a moderate risk. The puppies just don't get a benefit. Or yeah. take a Labrador and cross them with a Cocker Spaniel. They've both got a moderate risk. What you mm. want to do is dilute the genes with something like a Greyhound or a Whippet. That's what gets you your interest down. That's right. a most powerful point. Then the other things we've got discussed are exercise, which gets the most discussion, diet, which gets the least discussion, so there's an irony here, and nutrient, which at the moment is getting a lot of discussion. Yes, it's getting a lot of discussion. And I think that's going to be where everything kicks off. So <laughs> when, do you, when, do you, when do you want to hit it? But um, okay, so what about, so we're still in this eight to 10 week period. And something that's really important to me because I've experienced this is that an owner comes in for their first or second vaccine and you're doing an examination of the puppy and you think, wait a minute, something doesn't feel quite right here. And you've just extended the hip or you've just playing around the back end and things don't feel quite right. And I've I've had that where I've mentioned to an owner at that point, oh, your dog's hips feel a bit loose. This is something we need to be really aware about. And the reaction was terrible. <laughs> so what do you kind of do if you were the vet, first opinion, and you had someone in for a vaccine and you're just doing a feel around and the, the pups that say, let's go 12 weeks, and you feel a little clunk, or you feel that there isn't a good muscle mass forming around there, or you're just looking at some of the way that the puppy's moving, you think, wait a minute, something's not right. What is able, what can we do, what do we do in that kind of time frame, And what influences during that time frame? that period? Yeah, uh, now it's kind of interesting when you look at the pathology of what's happening, that, we know more about hip dysplasia in dogs than we do in any other species, including man. And so dogs were used as a model for hip dysplasia in man. When they study hip dysplasia in dogs, historically, they use eight weeks as the starting point because it's accepted that you don't start expressing those genes until eight weeks plus. <clears throat> so, so really, three, eight weeks, it's thought that you you don't really have much control, and it's after eight weeks that you do. Right. Now, if you diagnose eight weeks on a physical exam, that would be kind of remarkable, And but you've got the capacity to do something about it. At the end of the day, though, I think that really you should treat all dogs equally. You could argue, if I'm looking at a greyhound puppy, or I'm looking at a whippet, uh, another dog with a very low risk, you could say it probably doesn't really matter what you do, but if you're looking at a dog with a high risk, then really it's all about diet. Um, now, I don't mind which sequence is disgusting, but we even need to talk about exercise, we need to talk about diet, and we need to talk about nutrient. Yeah, okay. So which one? <laughs> which one? Which one do you want to go for you first? Should we start with, um, let's just do it alphabetically. Let's go D for diet. Go diet. Diet. Okay. So diet is is the most powerful tool. Um, and and so it's probably best to illustrate again with a story. So I told you about a group of Labradors at a high risk and a group of Greyhounds at a low risk. Well, a pet food man manufacturer back in the day um, organized a lifetime study of at-risk Labrador puppies. Mm -hmm. They took these puppies at eight weeks old and they divided those puppies into two groups. <clears throat> One group was given kind of ad lib feeding so that they developed uh, a body condition score that was more than it should be. They weren't obese, but they were overweight. So we got a group of fat puppies. They took another group and they restricted their feeding so that they were kept lean or idle. 
then they followed these two groups of parties for life. <clears throat> now, if you look at the statistics for those two groups of studies, they are remarkable. The difference between them is enormous. And the, mm-hmm. probably the most compelling statistic of two years old, the difference in the incidence of hip dysplasia was fourfold. Mm-hmm. You had a, about a 50% incidence in the fat puppies and a 13% incidence in the lean puppies. So these differences are dramatic. Onset of osteoarthritis was completely different. In the lean puppies, onset of osteoarthritis was at 12 years old. And in the, in the fat puppies, it was at six years old. So mm-hmm. these differences are really big. And, and it, if you want to look even wider, you only need to look at things like cruciate disease. So cruciate disease is another big one, four times higher incidence in overweight dogs compared to lean dogs. Now, I mm-hmm. very rarely find myself dealing with dogs with cruciate disease that are ideal body condition. So I think in those young dogs, the one thing you want to do is work on diet. And the, my observation from looking at forums that discuss diet is they talk about everything other than what's important. And what's important is calorie content, calorie density. And what the forums are talking about is everything but calorie density. They talk mm-hmm. about micronutrients, things like calcium and phosphate. They talk about protein concentrations. They talk about just macronutrients in general. They talk about whether they've got gluten in them, soy in them. And everyone seems to miss the king of it all, which is calorie content. Right. So I've just noticed that the lovely Rachel Miller says that I look amazing in my glasses, obviously. I have to be a little bit distracted there. <laughs> that real. Yeah, and that is that I, I'm not a nutritionist and I never claim to be anything that I'm not. I, I find that I play quite a good role helping people because I do sit with a little bit of a, a good understanding of stuff, but I'm certainly not a specialist or an expert in anything. And I have too noticed the same where people get very caught up in the the detail and they forget the really common obvious thing. And I'm quite, well, I was telling you earlier, I'm quite simple. It was lucky I got through vet school recently, actually. And, um, you know, I stick to keeping it, keep it simple and you'll be all right. And sometimes I feel people don't keep it simple. They try and make it more complex than it is. And I was listening to David Dykus doing a lecture about hip dysplasia today um, on the online pet health. And he too was talking about, you know, people get so caught up in supplementing and supplementing and supplementing because it's, it's complex and you need to fulfill all these requirements. But actually, no, keep it simple. Keep the weight lean. Don't let them gain weight. And as you say, that's calorie. So it, can you add anything more to nutrition? Because there's going to be people that are fascinated about nutrition or they're worried about it and they, um, they might be a puppy owner and they go into pets at home and they see all of these ranges of foods and they think, I don't know what to do. Can you give them any more advice than just body condition score? You know, don't allow your puppy to grow too quick, too, too soon. Be careful with your tip bits. Don't worry about supplementing this, that and the other. If you use a good reliable you know balanced brand you should be all right or what else would you say yeah I, there, there might be a perception that um what you feed your puppy is going to control how tall your puppy grows um, mm-hmm. that it's going to influence the growth plates for example and that that's not really the case um you, if you do something really badly wrong like oh, supplementing calcium for example you can alter the growth of a dog, yeah. But you have to do something really badly wrong. Commercial pet food can't really happen. And I think that some of the things that people are just kind of unaware of um, in terms of calorie concentration of pet food, wh- one of the common questions that you, you get asked is, when should you switch from a puppy food to an adult food, right? <clears throat> and the issue that we have at the moment is there's an epidemic of fat poorly conditioned puppies, people don't know that puppies are fat because how can you tell if a puppy is fat? You know, body condition scoring a puppy is super difficult. Uh, you need help, right? Mm-hmm. So I think, uh, and, and, and people seek help in all sorts of different places, but if you put a picture of a puppy up on a Facebook forum, for example, you'll just have a group of people just saying, wow, your puppy looks amazing, regardless of how fat they are. People can't tell um, how fat the puppy is. 
<laughs> so I think we need a lot of veterinary guidance when it comes to the body condition of a puppy. And then take a look at the calorie concentration of your pet food. And it's not easy finding it, right? But when you do find it, have a bit of context here. <laughs> if you look at calorie concentration for a Big Mac, a, a McDonald's Big Mac, that's 275 kilocalories per 100 grams, right? A Big Mac. I know this off by heart. So <laughs> I just looked it up because I thought, well, people need a point of comparison, right? Okay. So if you think of a Big Mac as being 275, that's its number. And then you think, well, I'll take a scoop of puppy food. You know, how does, how does it compare to a Big Mac? Well, if you look at the top 10 puppy foods, they're about 45% higher than a Big Mac in terms of calorie concentration. Right. So I looked at them and I took my energy bar for, you know, riding my bike for miles, and they're about the same. If you look at a, a little portion of puppy food and you think this is a tiny amount, instead you think you're looking at an energy bar because it's equivalent. This is just, it, you know, they're, they're just pure dry mass. I'm, I'm talking about dry puppy food here, not tin puppy food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolute calorie bombs. <clears throat> so be aware of the calorie concentration. I think that's that's really important. Hard to find on the label. Oh, again, we put something in the show notes about where to find this information. Yeah, yeah no, we should do, definitely. I, th I was thinking also, <laughs> I don't know why I thought of this, but this is, this is just simple Hannah again. When I grew up, I was actually quite plump, <laughs> and so was my brother. So it's obviously that something in the family. Sorry, family. Um, my mum was like, "Oh no, they'll just grow out of it. That's okay. Yeah, they'll eventually, you know, they go out and they go up. That's what they used to say to me and my brother. You'll spend this time growing outwards, and then you'll grow up out of it again. And I think there's a bit of the same attitude with puppies that people think, "Oh, they're going to get go out, and then they'll go up, and they'll go out, and then they'll go up." And um, therefore, I think people are quite just chilled out about it. You know, oh, he'll grow out of it. He needs his puppy fat to grow into. So that's one element that I think people don't see the importance of it because they're just going to go out, go up, go out, go up. And the other thing that's really difficult is his emotional topic. It's a really emotional topic. And if you think it's hard telling an owner of an adult dog that their dog is overweight, it's really hard telling the owner of a puppy that they're overweight. And my third point is the Andrex puppy was fat. <laughs> so if we're using that as a comparison, it's a really bad one. <laughs> there, there are many Andrex puppies. Some of them were fat. Um, so the first point, um, th I think the statistic is that, that fat puppies are five times more likely to be fat adults. So completely mm -hmm. opposite to perception. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, then the next point you make is a good one. It's an emotive subject. But there's a second reason why it's an emotive subject. And that's that's the, the bond between an owner and their dog. You know, this sort of loving bond between an owner and a dog. What's the most rewarding thing that you can do with your dog? You can mm -hmm. exercise with them, play with them, and feed them. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing with a dog who has an orthopedic problem is you're taking away all of those things in one go. You're yeah. saying you need to feed them less, you need to exercise them less, and vigorous play is kind of out of the question. Mm. So that's a really, really tough thing to deal with when you're, a, when you're an owner, is to, to, to be told all the things that are important in the bond between you and your dog, you're gonna have to adjust. Mm. No, definitely. So, I think our, our take home bit from the nutrition, because I know there's probably a lot of people waiting for that gem of um, there's going to be something that you can do. The most simple thing we can do, guys, be you a vet, a vet nurse, an owner, a dog trainer, a dog breeder, a kennel owner, is have the confidence to talk about weight. And we should all start take it from a taboo subject and make it something it's okay to talk about. You know, it's fine to suggest. I did it to my sister this evening, actually. Not that she's fat, her dog um, has been feeling better. So it's been climbing up onto the kitchen table again and eating the cat food because it's now feeling more comfortable in her back legs and lower back. She's gone back to the bad habit and she's put on the weight again. So um, I said, Sam, your dog's getting fat again. It's not a taboo subject, we can talk about it. Okay, let's now talk about so exercise. 
Yeah. My face. <laughs> Andrew's puppy may be fat, but more worryingly, it doesn't have a bum hole. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> right, let's do exercise now. Yeah. So uh, exercise is, is has been traditionally for many, many years the innocent bystander here. Um, people are targeting exercise as the thing that triggers hip dysplasia um, without any scientific basis for it. <laughs> and this is something that bothers me. I mentioned to you before when we were talking, if there are myths and fallacies, um, I can accept it. As soon as those myths start doing harm to our patients, then I can't accept it. And, and this, this, is, this is something which is super important. We've got this five-minute rule, it's called, which is this uh, myth that a puppy must have five minutes of exercise per month of age, three times a day. Otherwise, uh, they will develop skeletal and joint problems. And um, that's something that somebody just made up. Okay, that, that's important for everybody to know. It was just made up. And it's not based on any science at all. I and mean, we can go in that direction and say, where might it have come from? Um, but, but it's a fallacy. Okay. <laughs> it's just like a whoosh, Chinese chop. That's out of the window. So what do we know now? Because the person that originally made that statement would have done it with the best intention. So anybody that is still saying it, don't feel bad. It was probably came from a good place when it was initiated. But now we strongly feel otherwise. Now, what do we feel now, Mike? I'm going to have to tell you where it came from, right? Oh, no. Oh, no. Can I get my chin? I'm just going to hide. Where did it come from? So... Uh, back, I told you before, back in the 1970s, um, dogs were used as the model for understanding hip dysplasia in humans. Okay? In 1975, a veterinary surgeon uh, was commissioned to run some studies, and those studies were to try and find out what causes hip dysplasia in dogs. So he took a group of German Shepherd dogs and divided them into two, again, eight weeks old, one of those groups of dogs was cage confined as puppies. One of those groups of dogs was not cage confined as puppies. And what he found was that the group of dogs that were cage confined had a significantly lower incidence of hip dysplasia than the group that was outside. Right. <clears throat> now, his conclusion, which was published conclusion, was that if you kept immature dogs in cages that were so short that they couldn't stand up straight they had to have their legs akimbo like this so hip abducted posture and that hip abducted posture forced the ball into the socket okay it was this kind of posture from standing with your legs apart throughout your puppyhood it's a horrible thing to do but this is what happened so that became the origin of something called the pavlik harness which is used for children with hip dysplasia they have their legs pushed apart and if you develop with your legs pushed apart you won't develop hip dysplasia now this was misinterpreted by saying well keep them in a cage and they won't develop hip dysplasia let them out of a cage and they will i think that's the origin of the myth in the first instance i don't know for sure but i'm pretty confident that that's the origin of the myth okay now it's got perpetuated, perpetuated perpetuated but if you look at the science of it what information that we do know it's actually the reverse yeah. So a Norwegian group took uh, five breeds of dogs, large and giant breeds, and they studied that group of dogs to see what were the puppy environmental factors that influenced did they or didn't they develop hip dysplasia. And one of the most important things that protected against hip dysplasia was outdoor exercise. Yeah. The more exercise they did, the better. And that, that's completely in and the real thing to do is that probably anyone watching knows about the core, right? the, the core of your body is that network of muscles, ligaments, and tendons responsible for keeping it stable. Okay? And the core of your body is stabilized. <clears throat> you imagine that you're up and you're, say, eight years old, and you have a lap hip, which means that socket around the head. Well, the joint capsule isn't working properly. What holds your hips together? It's the, yeah. it's the yeah. muscle. Just pause 
have to just pause one minute because you're freezing quite a lot. So I don't know why that is. Let's just um, pause. Let's let the internet catch up because okay. it's so important. So you're back to normal again. We've had a bit of issues this evening with um, the internet. I've even had to move house tonight <laughs> to try and make sure that the internet works better. So let's pause. Just um, Mary had a little lamb. Say that. Let's see if it works. I had a little lamb. Fine, that's okay. We're back to normal. Let's just reverse a little bit. So let's just talk about the, the exercise and the muscles around the hip, etc. So you're eight weeks old yeah. and you've got a ball and socket joint, but the ball and socket joint isn't held together properly because you've got a loose capsule. That's what starts this off. This capsule around is loose. So the hip wants to do this. So if that's happening, what's the best thing that you can do is you can try and improve the strength of the other things that are responsible for holding the hip together. Yeah. Okay, there's other things that are a group of muscles called the hip stables. Yeah. So things yeah. like muscles, for example, the muscles of your bum. Who's there have to pick up the stack? They're now responsible primarily for holding the hip together. So if you want to strengthen those hip stabilizers, what do you do? You do more exercise. Yeah. But absolutely the worst thing that you can do if you've got a laxity situation and you've got a group of muscles that are supposed to be doing all the work, it make those muscles as weak as you possibly can by having a highly restrictive exercise program. Five minutes per month of eight, three times a day is insanely restrictive. Yeah. And productive. It's just counterintuitive and I would never recommend anybody does it. Now, now what happens then is when you say to people this, they say, yeah, but it's a good guideline for preventing people from doing excessive exercise. <clears throat> now, that's a little bit like saying, if you want to lose weight, you could eat three raisins a day. Uh, because if, you, if you give a guideline of three raisins a day, right, it'll stop you eating a fistful of hamburgers. Mm. But it's just not balanced. No. <clears throat> and the other big problem is that you've got this group of puppies now with hip laxity, poor muscling, poor core strength, they're not exercising so they're fat, they're poorly socialized, you've just got this myriad of problems that are causing ongoing issues. And if you yeah. think, if that's not enough for you, look at Guide Dogs for the Blind, right? So, oh no, oh no, what are you gonna say? <laughs> nothing bad, but Guide Dogs for the Blind are one of the most responsible organizations as well in the USA. So what do they do? They select very, very carefully for dogs that have a low risk of hip dysplasia. Yeah. Then once they get that low risk population of dogs, they give them to foster parents who do the best that you possibly can at controlled exercise. So they're always leash walk, they take care of them. There'll be some variability, right? Yeah. But you have what people would say is the best in controlled exercise in, in puppyhood. And what's the incidence of retirement in guide dogs because of musculoskeletal disorders? 28%. Right. <laughs> when you do the perfect things with young dogs, which is what the guide dogs do, you have a really high incidence of musculoskeletal conditions. If you look on the opposite end of the spectrum at wolves, who are totally irresponsible parents, according to popular opinion, that is that your puppies have no restriction of their exercise, they run around, play all day long, vigorous exercise. From about four months old, they run marathon distances. They cover enormous distances running. And what's their incidence of hip dysplasia? Approximately zero. Mm. So I think you can pretty much shoot bullets in the idea that exercise is the trigger. And it's that's good because you and I experience the owner that comes into your clinic in tears because they've been told that they caused hip dysplasia, crucifixity, elbow dysplasia because of over-exercise. Mm -hmm. If you allow dogs to do what they're supposed to do, what's natural, which is that they're born to run, it should be fine. If you encourage them to do exercise unnatural, ag agility training, eyeball when they're probably yeah okay so let's pause again because you're getting a bit stutchy and this is something that i really wanted to go into because when we and i'm i'm always happy to put my hands up and say 
wrong okay we'll correct our, our direction but when we're talking to vet nurses we're talking to vets we're talking to the public we very much talk about it. it's not the quantity it's the it's the type of exercise and um, I do something quite provocative in a lot of lectures where I, I've got a video clip of a puppy that must be no more than about seven weeks old and it's trying to walk across a laminate floor and its legs keep flipping out sideways, abducting, and it keeps frog legging as it's trying to grab traction and it can't get anywhere. And um, I just prompt people and say, look, let's just think about what we're doing. And then I've got a, another one of a dog doing fly ball where it's hitting impact forces. And I've got another one dog that's jumping over and twisting. And I'm just like, let's just, I'm not saying because we actually haven't got a huge amount of literature to support this statement, but what kind of influence do you think the type of exercise, we're not talking about the quantity, we're talking about the type of exercise. And I know that you'll probably find it hard to find data about this, but what's your thoughts? No, it's there. Um, so uh, if you want statistically significant uh, stare exercise in early puppyhood has been shown to be a risk factor. So I tell people to try and avoid uh, running up and down stairs in, in early puppyhood. When to stop that is an unknown. Um, this mm -hmm. is young puppies that we're talking about. The other one that's shown to be statistically significant was in a study of one breed only, which was boxers, but you can probably extrapolate. And that was slippery surfaces, exactly what you're saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so happy about that. That's a, it's a peculiar one, but it did show up in a study as a significantly uh, as a significant influence. Um, slippery yeah. surface. But that was also at a specific time frame, and that's what I think a lot of people get confused at. Because seriously, guys, I'm obsessed about arthritis. I spend all day, every day, doing stuff about it. And when I saw somebody on a post the other day said, "Neutering is terrible. It causes all kind of joint problems," I was like, oh, "No." It's very breed dependent, it's very sex dependent, it's very time scale dependent. And again, the study that looked at the whelping box slippery floor was a very specific time in that those pups' lives, wasn't it? It was something like between four and seven weeks. And the stairs was only up to, I think it was around about 14 weeks. So we still only have very defined amount of data that we're making some big advice statements on. But I think with what we know, we should be careful with our young dogs in those environments. So again, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. And I certainly, I would be saying to people, playing with a ball on a laminate floor in your house with a young pup sliding across and hitting the door frame, it's not cool. It's not gonna help the situation. But wanting to take them out onto the grass and letting them have a rough and tumble with another puppy where they're learning balance and agility and proprioceptive skills and socializing that's okay but what do you think about that <clears throat> you and i like the same thing keep it simple i think you can't argue against seven hundred and fifty thousand years of evolution so we know what wolves do we know that they do all of that rough and tumble play so that's okay mm. we know they don't get hip dysplasia we know they don't get cruciate disease lower back problems you know these are evolved over that period of time and they're the perfect example of survival of the fittest mm. now what wolves also do is run enormous distances and so people often ask well what about those people that are running long distances with their puppies well if they're running like wolves do which is low impact long distance running that's that's probably okay because wolves have been doing that for seven hundred fifty thousand years and it's not causing them hip dysplasia so low impact running, and if you if you kind of want to extrapolate, which is a fun thing to do, and you look at children instead of puppies, if you take children who do unnatural exercise like childhood gymnastics is the classic, mm. and baseball is another classic in the USA, those children doing unnatural exercise get problems, risk right. injuries, lower back problems, uh, elbow problems in later life. But if you take a group of children that run marathon distances, which happens, so there's a Guara Murray tribe in, in, in Chihuahua in, in, in South America. Those children <laughs> from childhood run marathon distances, and they actually, compared to other indigenous populations, have an incidence of musculoskeletal diseases, which is about three times less. So wow. people often talk about this wear and tear issue, but that's 
yeah, it's theoretically possible, but it's actually not borne out by science. If you do what you're born to do, which is just low impact running, that doesn't seem to be a problem. Yeah. Okay. And to support that, anybody that is wanting to go back and hear more about this sort of thing, then Professor Daryl Millis, who's good mates with Mike, I heard earlier. <laughs> no, I, I know him <laughs> only because he's a legend. <laughs> he's a legend, isn't he? Um, so he did a live with us back in January, and you can find it on our YouTube where we're really blowing apart that controlled exercise myth. And he talks about a lot of studies with beagles on treadmills that are doing 20K a day for 365 days in the year. And they're looking at cartilage thickness and all manner of things. And his feelings is very much the same. It's not the quantity. It is the, it is the type of exercise. But high torsional, high impact, that wouldn't be desirable. So think about what you're doing rather than being so possessed about how much you're doing. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So we let's. Got, we got neutering now. <laughs> okay. Let's start neutering. <laughs> oh, no. Right. This is a quick one, right? And re relatively speaking, it's a quick one. Okay. Go for it. It's the subject of the moment is the impact of neutering on musculoskeletal disease. <clears throat> and, um, and this is on the back of some astonishingly good work. So, mm -hmm. University of California, David. I've done a series of studies looking at the impact of neutering on multiple things, most importantly, developmental orthopedic disease and cancer. Now, their study is free access. And it's, yeah, I'll link. it's quite a readable study, although yeah. it's huge. So you need to be able to hone down on what's important. Now, I think the problem, what happened recently, at least in the UK, is that there was an editorial published about this study. And if you look at the editorial, it has a picture of a Great Dane puppy. And above it, it says uh, early neutering causes a three times higher risk of developmental orthopedic disease. And then it follows up with an abbreviated piece that says if you've got a large breed dog, don't neuter them before a year or even two years of age because that increases their risk of problems. That, that's absolutely not what the paper <laughs> no. not even close to it so no. the drug vein for example that actually had no evidence for an increased risk of early neutering and what they don't talk about is the flip side of that coin and if you look at the great dane as an example you know what that incidence in their lifetime is of pyometria and mammary cancer if they're right. not it's 68 percent mm. So you, you're, you're making a choice uh, based on evidence that's been misinterpreted and you're not thinking about the opposite side of the coin, which is that actually there are important reasons that we're neutering animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my advice if you're, if, if you're thinking about early neutering is look at the actual paper because it's readable or if you go on the Vet Lessons website, I've made a plain English summary of a risk analysis for each of the popular breeds. Um, and then think about the other reasons why you might have to neutral an Yeah. There is I think, I think just to just say, just butt in, I think it's it 35 dog breeds that they look at. There's an extensive list of breeds, and they do divide it down into male and female. And even in the same breed, there's different reasons to neuter male and female at different ages. And it's not what you think. You know, it really doesn't fall nicely, succinctly into all large breeds. It's really quite the reverse. You sit there going, God, this is really complicated. So when I replied to somebody the other day that had just put it all into one lump, early neutering is to blame for everything. I couldn't actually even briefly try and summarize because you do need to look at the table because it's not what you expect, is it? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there you go. So we can put something again. You've got show notes, have you? We can put something about that in there. Yeah, yeah, totally. So what we can do, guys, is we can put it in the thread here below so you can go and have a read because this is what science is about. Um, and I think something that I'm just going to have a little bit of a rant about is that often people really 
forget how progressed we are becoming. You know, science and clinical trials and studies and perspective and retrospective. We're really beginning to break down some of these myths. And then we have quite a lot of opposition. But, you know, why should we? We should all be going, God, that's really interesting. We can really use this and progress. But there's a lot of people that are really like, anti aren't they they um they just want to yeah anyway we won't get there what are we going to talk about next should we right. so, so, so now what you've got is your risk factors for developing hip dysplasia and then and then you've got your two groups you've got your puppy that has radiographs with hip dysplasia which we ta tackle next because that's the common situation you have an owner who says oh my god my dog's got hip dysplasia. This is a life sentence. <clears throat> yeah. So, so we need to tackle what happens when your dog has an X-ray diagnosis of hip dysplasia, but no clinical signs. <clears throat> yes, I think that's a very good one. And there is a surprisingly large body of data about what happens to those dogs. Can we just talk about what the clinical signs you would expect to see so people know what you're talking about? So we're now four to six months old. Well, no, let's do six months to a year. Should we do six months to a year? And if you, what would be the clinical signs that you would expect to see if that dog had hip, like clinically significant hip dysplasia? They're not that clearly defined in my experience. <laughs> They're quite variable. And so you, you talk about some dogs who have their hind limbs held close together. So they're the ones that they talk about having boxy hips because they walk like a ballerina. Um, you have some dogs that do the opposite, that their legs are quite wide apart. <clears throat> I think some of the characteristic features, I would describe the average puppy as looking like a dog who is 20 years old. Mm. The, compared to another puppy, they just seem like they're old. They don't want to exercise as much. Where they do try to exercise, they get super stiff. Uh, their capacity to exercise is poorer. You ask them to jump onto something and they can't do it. You ask them to climb stairs and they can't do it. So they, they say that, that on average, a dog with clinical hip dysplasia takes two and a half times longer to climb a flight of stairs than a dog that doesn't. So and Also, I think behaviorally, just to bring in a bit of a behavioral side, they might be puppies that really are quite out there. You know, they, they really full of the appeasement, you know, oh, they're into everything. They can't really be, they don't engage. They don't, they don't seem to learn as quickly. They're harder to train. They might also be puppies that are out on a walk. They just lay down. They just seem to be bursts of energy and then they flop and then they have a kind of get their breath back and then they burst of energy and then just flop. So it is a very broad description because i know a lot of people go well they're not wobbling their hips they're not wobbling from the waist so it can't be hip space it's not that clear cut <laughs> yeah i suppose it's helpful to think well what else could it be that causes a puppy to move abnormally right yeah and the list is not that long and um, the classic uh would be panosteitis i guess if you've got a young dog so that's what people call growing pains you know you've got inflammation of bone mm. Now, panosteitis is, is potentially less common, but it's what everyone wishes for because you grow yeah. out of it. And, and a fairly typical scenario is a person says to their group of friends, I don't know what's wrong with my dog, but they seem to be not moving normally. And then the answer will be what you want it to be rather than what it is, which is, oh, it's probably growing pains. It's probably panosteitis. Now, it's actually quite easy to differentiate the two conditions with a veterinary clinical exam. <clears throat> so I think my best advice would be, if you think your puppy is moving abnormally, go to that. <laughs> <laughs> you can differentiate those two conditions pretty easily. Okay, so this is where I get to be uh, very much on the side of the Holly's Army, on the side of the owner. Um, I would say that a lot of vets find this area very difficult to advise on and I love being a vet and I love my colleagues and I love my profession. This isn't me being negative towards them, but it's a very difficult thing to diagnose in a consult with a young puppy moving around with an owner that doesn't want to hear what you want to tell them. What happens if that 
owner goes to a vet and actually just say, look, something's not right. And the vet says, no, I think it's fine. But the owner goes away and still isn't quite sure. What would you advise in that situation? Because it is difficult. It's brought up a lot in Holly's Army. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing I do is uh, a clinical assessment. <clears throat> and the clinical assessment is it's actually relatively basic. Um, we're finding out, does this dog have a problem with extending the hips? Now, that includes things at home, which means climbing up flights of stairs, jumping up on the owner. So if I have a dog that spends half of their life paws up against the owners, I know they can extend their hips fine, right? Just a simple thing like that, can they extend their hips at home, is something that I think is super valuable. Yeah. Now, if you've got a really puppy in the clinic and you grab hold of their hip and try and extend it and they resent it and you say, oh, this is a problem with the hips, but that same puppy is instantly jumping up and extending their hips voluntarily, I think it's probably they resent my exam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the and I think clinical exam is super important. Well, you can also, just to plug a bit of a CAM thing, you probably don't know we do this. Um, in the CAM website under How Can CAM Help, in downloads and resources, there is a PDF called Suspicion of Chronic Pain. Yes, at that point, you know, it's, it's, chronic pain is the right terminology. But in there, on this diagram, it talks about behavior, postural, capability, um, and physical changes. And if you as an owner are going, I'm really worried about this. This is really concerning me. I don't think the vet sees what I'm seeing. Do take that PDF, fill in what you're seeing, and take it to your vet and it might help clarify what you see at home compared to what they're seeing in the consult room if that makes any sense there you go yeah. um we jumped ahead though because we wanted to talk about dogs with a diagnosis on x-ray but no clinical signs yeah yes go back yes they're important because they're more common right it's, it's more common to have a dog with a diagnosis of hip dysplasia that either has no clinical signs or such subtle clinical signs but the, the, the general population don't really know what happens to those dogs. Mm -hmm. What happens to the dogs that have a diagnosis but no clinical signs to puppies? And, and there's good information of what happens to those dogs. So the reason I say this good is that there are literally tens of thousands of dogs in Sweden that are insured. They have a 75% insurance rate. And the, the biggest insurer is Agria. And Agria published study after study after study on what happens to insured dogs with a diagnosis of a condition that have no clinical signs. Ooh, yes. Yeah. Got it. Uh, because I read it and I was like, it's, it's a hard paper to read. It's, there's a oh, lot. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, essentially, what you've got <clears throat> is uh, different breeds, some of the most popular ones. So, Labrador. Golden Retriever, Rottweiler, Bernese Mountain Dog, and one maybe that I've forgotten. <clears throat> and they um, take dogs that have a diagnosis of hip dysplasia, which is an incidental diagnosis. They're being screened, and their x-rays show that they have hip dysplasia, and they follow them through life, and they say, how likely are those dogs to have an insurance claim made for their hip dysplasia? And on average, the excess is small. So generally, if they've got a problem, someone's going to make a claim, right? Yeah. Follow through throughout life and say, well, what proportion of dogs with mild, moderate, and severe hip dysplasia develop clinical signs that are bad enough that an owner makes a claim? Tell me. Yeah. So if we take a Labrador as an example, and that dog's diagnosed with mild hip dysplasia, the chance of an owner making a claim within that dog's lifetime is 1.5%. Yeah, low. Very low. So mild displays, and even across the other breeds, the German Shepherd was the least forgiving, but even then, it's a small number. Mm. If you take a, a Labrador with moderate hip dysplasia, it's only 5% that are making mm. it. And if you take a Labrador with severe hip dysplasia, it's 15%. Yeah. So the moral of the story is that the vast majority of puppies with an incidental finding of hip dysplasia even when it's severe, can have a really normal life. Yeah. Now, what they don't say in the study, but what's my observation, this is anecdote, but I've spent some time in Sweden, is that on average the dogs in Sweden are lean 
and fit. They do a lot of exercise. <clears throat> so the second study, which gives us some information, is what's the influence of keeping dogs lean and fit? And the US military answered this question. So the US military took a group of dogs, Belgian Shepherds and German Shepherds, that was in the same kind of way. They either had no hip dysplasia or they had mild or moderate hip dysplasia. If they had severe, they were out of the program, right? They followed those dogs for life and they worked out what was the difference in working life of dogs with a diagnosis compared to a dog which has no hip dysplasia. It wasn't any different. And actually, when you look at the statistics of that study, it wasn't any different. Truly, it wasn't any different. And wow. It's because these dogs were kept fit and lean. I'm convinced of that. So that's the priority. When you have a young dog that has a diagnosis of hip dysplasia, don't despair. The statistics are on your side. Your focus should be on keeping them lean and fit. Okay, so I'm now going to be a little bit of a devil's advocate here then. I'm going to um, plant a bomb. I'll, I'll drink first. <laughs> Have a drink before I plant my bomb. Okay. <laughs> so, JPS, TPO, DPO surgeries, they're all done at such an early stage in a dog's life where we're now saying, are they... A good thing to do so for example guys there's something called the jps the juvenile pelvic symphodiesis is that right pretty close yeah <laughs> pretty much and that's got to be that's a decision to be made by 16 weeks 16 weeks okay and they know from the study that it's good in moderate oa but it's not really going to be great in severe not oa hip dysplasia it's potentially not going to be effective in severe hip dysplasia. And if they are going to have a JPS, they've also got to be neutered at the same time. So we've got an early neutering for a moderate hip dysplasia. What do you think about these surgeries, knowing that actually many of these dogs might go on to be completely asymptomatic? Um, this is how I address that, because it's a really important thing. Um, there's something called number needed to treat. <clears throat> so what number needed to treat is, it, it's, it's not really used much in veterinary medicine, but it's a big thing in human medicine. And to, if you give an illustration of number needed to treat, um, look at statin drugs. <clears throat> no. uh -oh. I'm going somewhere with this. So, so with, a, with a statin drug, what you do is you say, right, well, I want to prevent an important problem, which is a cardiac arrest, a stroke, death essentially how many people will i have to give a statin drug to in order to prevent one death right that number's somewhere around about 160 170 people okay so you do an intervention in this case give a drug for four years time to 167 people you'll prevent a problem in one Wow. So in, in human medicine, there's a big debate about, well, should we give statins then? But then the argument is, well, they're pretty safe drugs. Yeah, they have some side effects, but it's a pretty benign thing. And the impact of not having it is that you die. Yeah. So number needed to treat in that circumstance of 167 is, is considered an okay. It's appropriate. Now, if you apply the same principle to dogs with hip dysplasia, what you're saying is that I have a puppy who is, let's say, four months old, and at that point, they generally don't have clinical signs. I'm going to do an operation on that dog with no clinical sign. How many puppies would I have to operate to prevent one from developing clinical hip dysplasia? Okay. Yes. So, so what we know is that moderate hip dysplasia in a Labrador, for example, results in clinical signs in about 15%. Yeah, so, so what, we're, what we're saying is that I'll have to do a JPS surgery in 20 odd dogs in order to prevent one from getting a clinical sign. If it's uh, the mildest problem, if it's a moderate problem, maybe 10 of the dogs in order to prevent one from developing a clinical sign. Okay, so 10 operations to prevent one from getting a problem. Is that okay? 
for most people you'd say no that's not okay mm. and the next question is is the operation a benign operation yeah it's a relatively benign operation it's an effective operation but if you want to do it you need two things that in the uk are a problem mm -hmm. um, is that you need to do a special x-ray test yeah mm -hmm. which extraction and index is a pen hip thing yeah which is not allowed in the uk okay, okay. If you're going to do a JPS without it, you're really working blind. So JPS in the UK is hampered by that the test that you use to determine is this dog a candidate isn't available in the UK because of their X-ray protection. That's problem number one. Problem number two is like you say, you need to neuter them because yeah. if you neuter them at the time that you do JPS, you're taking a dog that could have the genes for hip dysplasia and you're putting them back into the gene pool. Yeah. So yeah. someone, my dog's fine. Reach a year of age, the hips look fine. They've still got the genes that code for hip dysplasia. Back into the gene pool they go. Back goes our population incidence of hip dysplasia. So for me, APS is a surgery that has not not many indications. Now, DPO and PPO, you can apply the same kind of thing, of course. If you have a dog who has no clinical signs and you want to do an operation, it's the same thing. How many people you have to do an operation on to save one from a problem? It might be 10 or 20. That's an unexpectedly high risk for a dog. But, you know, treating 20 dogs to save one from a problem, which is quite treatable, because you can do a hit later, right? Yeah. The worst case scenario isn't that that dog's going to die. It's that you have to treat them with surgery later, potentially, or medical yes. treatment later. Yeah. So and I think that's the thing is that um, total hip replacements are very successful now, aren't they? Yes. Now, it, total hip replacement is a brilliant surgery, um, but you only do it if you have to do it. Um, yeah. and, the, and, and the reason with, that you only do hip replacement if you had to do it is because of the consequence of a problem or a side effect. Now, if you look at the, the best surgeons doing hip replacement, and there are some people who are brilliant at hip replacement, their major complication rate is about one in 20. So one in 20 dogs will have a serious problem that can leave them worse than before. So hip replacement will bring the other 95% to having a life-changing experience. You operate one hip and it improves the dog on the opposite hip too. So one hip replacement changes a dog's life. But if something goes wrong, it can be a big, big problem. That's mm -hmm. a little summary of hip replacement. Yeah, no, it's really, that is really difficult because there's been a couple of people on Holly's Army that have had that happen. And, you know, as a vet, then it's very difficult kind of advising other people, no, no, it's, it's a good surgery when you've got somebody that has had the bad experience. But as you say, it's, um, I think Dr. Karen Perry Butler was saying it's got something like 90 to 95% success rate now, hasn't it? which fits with your figures. Yes. Now, here is uh, me putting my neck on the line. Um, <clears throat> when you're an owner who's making a decision and you go to the event, you're entitled to ask three really important questions. What are my options for whatever condition you're treating? What are the benefits and the risks of those options? And what's the chances of some data, chances of a positive compared to a negative outcome. Now, if you're talking about hip replacement, the answer will be 95% success. But is that your success rate about to do the operation? Or is mm. that Noel Fitzpatrick or Bill Lisky or mm. another legend at hip replacement who is super experienced? And I think there is. People are intimidated by doing it. They don't want to say, yeah, but it's not your success rate. <laughs> no, that's really true. Like, I'll put my hands up. You know, years gone past, I used to do um, surgeries. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare now. Like, I've got massive, you're on a pedestal to me because I'm just like, no, stressful, pressure's on. And everybody's got to learn. Everybody's got to start somewhere, haven't they? And that's the truth, isn't it? <laughs> So I think it is fair. You are allowed to say the, to the person that is treating your dog, how many of those have you done and recently? 
is a fair play to ask, isn't it? This, that, that, you know, there people are intimidated, and I, and I, I put myself in that position. If I went to see a consultant, and the consultant said, "I'm going to do this operation on you," I think I would be intimidated by saying, "Yeah, how, how many of these have you done, Chief?" Um, mm -hmm. Questions I think that you can ask, which are kind of more gentle, um, that will give you an idea. Um, questions like, "How long will the operation take?" And listen, if this was your own dog, would you do the operation personally? Or would you ask one of your colleagues? Oh, that's a good one. Those are quite, they're quite gentle questions. You know, somebody can me, you know, would you do an operation on your own pet, or would you prefer one of your friends to do the operation? And it was a knee replacement. I'd ask Matt Allen to do it, or I'd ask not. <laughs> it's it's pretty simple for me. But if it was anything else, I'd be happy happy to tackle it myself. And I think that'd be a pretty revealing question. Or an owner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a. I think that's really good advice. That's something that is really interesting. Running Cam is that I think a lot of the vet profession believe that we're just spilling out data and you know sticking to facts and what's coming out of papers. And but actually, a lot of owners that come to Cam are really they really want support in decision making because it's hard, and they are potentially sometimes life-changing decisions these owners have taken away from a practice having had 20 minutes with a professional like you and then, then they've gone home and they're, they're, they're trying to calculate you know the pros the cons and what they should do anyway um so we talked about that there's a lot of people that wouldn't be able to afford a total hip replacement because we've been going on for quite a while can we just touch on um alternative let's go into like dare we say the salvage situation we've talked about total hip replacement you can do that to any at any point can't you you don't have to rush into that so anybody who's got a young dog and the vets saying or their friends said oh you need a total hip replacement and you're like well i haven't tried all of the conservative options yet i haven't tried strong pain relief hydrotherapy controlled exercise weight loss you know physiotherapy um, maybe I should try those first before I go to surgery. What's your thoughts on that? Would you say you haven't got to rush? You can take your time? Yeah, I, my personal experience on a hip assessment um, is about one in four to one in five of the dogs that I assess will get a hip replacement. <clears throat> so if you talk about the dropout, what happens to the other three out of, of four cases? Uh, most of them, their problem is hip dysplasia. It's cruciate disease. It's a big, big deal, right? It's, mm -hmm. The dog has a diagnosis of hip dysplasia when they're young, and that is the tag that they wear for the rest of their life. And whenever they get a problem, it's like somebody sneezing during COVID. It must be, it must be COVID, right? You sneeze, mm -hmm. it must be COVID. It's not flu. Now, this is what happens with hip dysplasia. Everything else that happens, it's attributed to hip dysplasia. But more often than not, if an adult dog hind limb limping, it's not hip dysplasia, it's something else. And the big candidates are knee problems and lower back problems. Mm -hmm. so if an adult dog limping with a diagnosis of hip dysplasia, it's probably not the hips. Mm -hmm. The genes that okay. cause hip dysplasia overlap the genes that cause lower back problems, the genes that cause knee problems. So a dog with one, often gets the others so that's the first yeah. the dogs that don't have another diagnosis but it's truly coming from the hips we talk about uh, your area which is multimodal therapy and the way that i put it to people is <clears throat> maybe a little bit different if louise is watching she's gonna <laughs> <laughs> So Louise and I are into, into cycling, and um, British cycling is famous for something called the, the accumulation of marginal gains. Yes. So this is what I say to people. If you have a dog with an orthopedic problem that you're managing non-surgically, imagine instead of you and your dog that you are a coach or a trainer and that your dog is your athlete. And instead of you training, you're trying to make the athlete the best that they can be. So if we think about how that would pan out in an ideal world, you, Hannah, the coach, the job that you're managing, you have to start with the basics, the fundamentals. 
And what is the fundamentals? That is to make your athlete lean and fit. Okay, same thing with the arthritis. You want your athlete to be lean and fit. Let's say you do that. You make your athlete lean and fit, but they're not winning anything. You want them to be the best, win the first time. So mm -hmm. the next? Well, then you give them a performance enhancing drug, okay? So they're lean and fit, and you add a performance enhancing drug. So if you're a coach, that might be testosterone, eco, whatever. And if you do that, and you don't imagine we're talking about our workforce, which is a non steroidal anti inflammatory drug. That's your performance enhancing drug. Yeah. A lean, fit athlete, you give them a performance enhancing drug. They usually really, really well in the performance enhancing drug. So what happens next? They're doing really well, but they're not quite perfect. Then you add all those other little things that put together make a difference. So you give them a comfortable pillow to sleep in. You make sure that they sleep well at night. You get everything in order to make your athlete not number two, but number one. So now I've given my athlete, made them fit, lean, they've had a performance enhancing drug, they're not quite there, and I, let's say, give them cod liver oil. They win everything in sight. Mm. We have a perfect situation. Our, our athletes winning everything because mm -hmm. of the combination. What are you going to do next as the coach? So as the coach, what you do next is you monitor their performance very carefully. You watch them. And then you just tweak the dials a little bit. You maybe increase the dose of one thing, decrease the dose of another thing. So it's a constant monitoring program. Voice mm -hmm. test. Well, you're just tweaking things, and that's what you do, right? That's that's yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, Cam, I think you're. I love the way that you put that. Um, I think Cam actually really started from the fact that I grew up with two family Labradors in my my um, childhood, Bruno and Bruno and Lancer, and both dogs were put to sleep because they went off their back legs. You know, so I think um, Bruno was put to sleep when I was about nine years old. But my family absolutely loved the dog. The dog was part of the family, but it wasn't insured. And I wasn't from a high income family. You know, I got to university on a bit of a bursary, really. But it didn't mean my family didn't love that dog. And I think Cam very much comes from the fact that there's a lot of people out there that haven't got a huge um, pocket to throw at their animal. But it doesn't mean they don't love them. So all of these marginal gains are still really, really important. And I'm glad that you've mentioned them because they can still have a massive impact on pain state. And they can still take a dog from a very low quality of life to improving that quality of life. And I want owners who are watching this that think I can't afford all this. That doesn't make you a bad owner. But if you make sure that your dog isn't doing further harm, is being exercised correctly, is at the right body weight, you use enrichment, you use the anti-inflammatories and other medications where you can, if you can't afford a total hip replacement or femoral head and neck osteosomy, you know, that's not, you're not a bad person. But yeah, camp basically came from a fact. I think there's a big pool out of people, pool of people out there that need conservative advice. You know, we do invite lovely people like you onto the platform because we've now got a big population of people that can explore different avenues. But the core is get the foundations right. And I think that takes us back nicely to the fact that there isn't a rush on those surgeries, total hip replacements, actually femoral head and neck excision. You know, you don't have to rush into them. You can take your time and explore these different avenues. And if it's still not working, once you've got a multimodal in place, then the surgery is there available for you. But I think a lot of people feel rushed, though, don't they? Well, uh, here's what happens. This mm -hmm. is what so I just gave you the ideal, but in reality, that ideal is rarely reached. This is the reality of what happens between the coach and the athlete in veterinary medicine. So the starting point is the fundamentals. I have a dog who is painful and usually overweight. My target is to get them exercising more, improve their core strength and get them to lose weight. Mm but that's really difficult to do. That's my overweight athlete that's target is the Tour de France. So mm -hmm. we try, and then we fail. So what do we do? We've tried and failed. We give them a performance enhancing drug. 
mm. which are non-steroidal. So we didn't, and they improve a lot. Are mm. they in the Tour de France? No, because our fundamentals aren't there. So mm. what do we do then? We say, well, we've made them a lot better, but we want them to get better still. So we do the marginal gains approach. When we do the marginal gains approach, this is what people tend to do. They say, I'm going to make them a bit better still. They get a bit better still. And then they say, oh, I don't need a performance enhancing drug anymore. Mm. They're unsavory. They've got side effects. I don't want to give the animal equivalent of EPO testosterone to my dog. That non-steroid I have to go. I need to reduce the amount. I need to get rid of it if I can. And what happens if you did that with your athlete? They would do super badly. The fundamentals aren't there. We've taken away the most powerful of our performance, mm -hmm. which is a non-steroidal. And then we've told everybody, this is how you treat them. It's with cod liver oil, uh, CBD, a supplement. Now, now, that approach is one that is very, very common. We want to give the things which have the least impact in order mm -hmm. to replace the things that have the biggest impact, mm -hmm. uh, which is get them fit, get their core strength up, get their environment right, and then put them on an non-steroidal. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you said that because it does, it does drive us a little bit mad, me and the ambassadors who are these lovely people that overlook Holly's army. And you've got, you've got people coming in to our community group and th they really are there wanting help and support, but they're caught up in the meshwork of all the little bitty, bitty, well-marketed bits and bobs and they come in asking, what do you think of this supplement? What do you think of this um, CBD oil that I've got from Holland and Barrett? What do you think about this? And you're like, dog's really fat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might be the key thing here is let's focus on the weight. But, you know, it's human nature. I think what we've realized since we've been running CAM is that we're dealing with people that are very vulnerable. And I know that in parts of my life when I've been really vulnerable, I've made some really weird decisions. And I've focused on some really you know, I haven't been quite level. And I think we forget that when people are vulnerable and they're worried and they're panicking about their dog, they clutch at straws. And what Cam tries to do is take people back to the basics and go, right, these are really solid interventions, guys. Those are little, you know, they're, they're um, icing on the cake, the cherries, the, the hundreds and thousands, but the cake, this is the cake. Um, just talking about to complete the picture for people and like the total hip replacement, can we just talk a little bit about the salvage surgery? Because I know that there are people on Holly's Army that go, well, I can't for, for afford a total hip replacement, but, you know, my dog is really, really quite uncomfortable. Do you promote, the, you know, femoral head and neck excision, or do you think it's a no? The, uh, there are two other operations, uh, one that's well known and one that isn't. Femoral head and neck excision is one, and hip denervation surgery is the other. Ooh. You, you know? <laughs> I, no, I completely forgot about that and I can only really remember it from like urectomies at vet school with horses yeah it's the same yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. so and it's it's actually really well studied hip denervation surgery is really well studied um so but but it's only it's only used in certain regions quite popular in Germany and South America and it's a super simple procedure you can treat both hips at once and you just do a periosteal split, which means you take you take out a bit of the nerve supply to the hip. It takes about 10 minutes per side to do. And it's like the, the ultimate painkiller. You, you remove the pain, but nothing else. Right. So the candidate for me is the dog who responds to non-steroidals, but for one reason or another can't tolerate non-steroidals. They, they cause a problem, um, either a real problem or a conceptual problem. And those ones, you know, they respond to a painkiller. So if you take away pain surgically, you can make a good improvement. And then femoral head and neck excision is the other one. That's, that's kind of interesting um, operation because it's also pretty well studied. And the, the wisdom with femoral head and neck excision is that the smaller you are, the better you can tolerate the mechanical consequence of femoral head and neck excision which is that essentially you've got one leg that's weaker and shorter compared to the opposite. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're a cat, are we allowed to say that? <laughs> or, oh, my cat's had it. Derek, Derek, the cat has had <laughs> Yes. If you're a cat or a small dog, the reputation of femoral head and neck excision is good, although you move differently. 
you know, at least nine out of 10 owners of, of, of dogs that are less than 15 kilos and have that surgery will report that despite the fact that their animals don't move the same, that they are very mobile and that they're very happy with their yeah, dog. 19 and he had it done when he was two. Yeah. Yeah, so the little ones seem to do well. The dogs that don't seem to do well are, are the dogs that are really athletic. The dogs that are they're operated when they're old do worse compared to the dogs that are operated when they're young and dogs uh, they seem to be worse so your selection tends to be smaller dogs uh you're operating when they're relatively younger um and um and dogs that are a bit sedentary and cats <coughs> now the big big thing is if you've got an older dog and you're making that decision you've got to make sure they haven't got cruciate disease before you do that operation <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 definitely and also i think it's fair to say that rehab is absolutely imperative after that surgery yeah and and a, and a good operation so the, 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 there was a german study that looked at outcome and they showed that there was a significant association with surgical technique so if a spur is left on the on the femoral neck a little spur of bone what tends to happen is they get off to a really slow start after the operation and i get really nervous if i see a dog that comes in for physio, for example, where I'm working and the owners say, look, they, they had a femoral head and neck excision, but they're just not walking very well at the beginning. That's a real warning sign. I want to make sure I've got a spur on there because um, a surgical error is a big, big problem. Yeah. Okay. No, that's good. I, no, that's, that's good because that is, it does come up in Holly's army quite a lot. Um, and I think it's fair to say in first opinion practice we still tend to deal with people that are bringing in their dogs quite late to us and that's where you start really pulling at you know what what can we do you know this dog is in the later part of his life he's got serious muscle wastage he's got serious um, neuromotor issues proprioceptive problems because this has been going on such a long time and it's come in and it's really quite end stage and you know, that is a surgery that people do throw around. But, yeah, I think you've said, you know, that's quite a, a major decision if you're going to go down that route. And it's going to need a huge amount of support to get through it. Yeah. Do you know, I've done many um, denovations myself. And uh, it seems like witchcraft denovation surgery. It seems like it shouldn't work. But it has quite a lot of pedigree. So for me, I'm seeing an old dog and they've got obvious clinical signs. I'll x-ray their knees, even if their physical exam is okay, I want to be certain. I'll make sure they don't have lower back pain because that can be treated very effectively medically. And right. if I'm certain that it's the hips, I'll do a denovation because I can do both sides at once and they can be out the same day. Um, oh. need a rehab um, after that one. They're literally just, you know, off they go straight away. They don't need to be exercised restricted. The only two risks are it doesn't work as well as you think it will and they seem yeah. to get pins and needles they want it they really itchy afterwards um, right. does so, that stay no 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 it's the first couple of weeks uh, they tend to get wound um pr problems because they they, they want to lick themselves to themselves um, after mm -hmm. the operation it's it, it's a gp operation it's a straightforward procedure I, as a specialist i you know i see dogs that are going to get a hip replacement um, and that that remains the gold standard. Ah, ah see, I'm learning loads. Love it. Um, you have actually stitched yourself up. You don't realise, but you keep talking about lower back, and that is something that we have not had somebody talk about lumbosacral. Are you are you good with lumbosacral? Medical management of. <laughs> okay, good. Well, you're coming back because that comes up all the time, and um, I. Holly had terrible lumbosacral and I just really would love people to know more about it because I think there's a lot of dogs out there that have low back pain and people don't really notice. They think the drop tail and the like the arching of the lower back and the, the little you know footsteps in the in the back, they're always just getting old. You're like, oh, no, that's pain. Please help them. So we can talk about that. And um, you've been talking amazingly for nearly an hour and a half, which is awesome. And by the way, Louise was listening. And she hasn't heckled you, even though she told me, she promised me she would. <laughs> yeah, you get me eventually. <laughs> um, 
I'd love to say thank you so much because it's been awesome. It has been really awesome. I felt we've covered a really huge topic. We haven't shied away from any of the nasty kind of controversial areas. I know that there's going to be lots and lots of comments um, that we hopefully will be able to, you know, over the next few days, I'll answer your questions, guys. Um, but yeah, I feel that we've done okay. So please say thank you, guys. Um, I really hope that Mike's going to come back and talk to us again. And um, there were a couple of things that I might ask him to answer, stem cells and all that sort of stuff. But um, until then, thanks. <laughs> when do you get your new plane? Tomorrow morning? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, that is so cool. Well, me and Luna will come out and see you. But there's a lady out there already called Rachel Meadows who can't wait for you to arrive in New Zealand because she's been listening and she's <laughs> <really excited. laughs> So cool. Okay, right. I'm going to say goodbye, guys. Um, and we will see you next Tuesday. We've got the lovely Helly coming back who's a crazy physio who was talking about the biomechanics of obesity last time. We had such a laugh. This time, we're going to probably talk about um, where does physio fit in in case management. So we'll see you next Tuesday. See you later.